This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Today, Liz Wolf and I are joined by our colleague, Matt Welch, editor at large at Reason and podcaster on the Reason Roundtable and the fifth column with Camille Foster and Michael Moynihan. He's going to help us break down the recent Iowa caucus results and talk about what it means for the election going forward. We also want to discuss where libertarians and independents might be leaning at this point in the presidential race. And also want to talk about some of the increasingly glaring divides within libertarianism that have led to different factions pursuing very different strategies and hold widely divergent views of political candidates like Trump, Vivek Ramaswamy, Ron DeSantis, and Nikki Haley. Matt, thank you for talking with us. Thanks, and uh, for bringing me into the uh, the fantastic uh, JAQ den. I appreciate it. The den Happy of Jack Astory, if you will. <laughs> so let's bring up. Uh, th this is uh, the this is from NPR. The, these are the results from the Iowa caucus. We see Trump took fifty one percent of the vote. DeSantis about twenty one percent. Haley third place, nineteen percent. Vivek. 7.7% and Asa Hutchinson with 0.2% of the vote. Um, where does that leave the race at this point in your estimation, Matt? Welch? That was as good of a result for Donald Trump as he could have possibly expected, uh, which is, yes, it's sort of confirmed that he has more than 50%, a little bit more than 50% of the vote, at least in Iowa, but also that it was close between Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, and even that DeSantis was ahead is good for Trump because it keeps DeSantis uh, more in the race than he might have otherwise been. If Nikki Haley would have, mm -hmm. you know, somehow gotten 30 percent and DeSantis 15, he probably would have dropped out of the race and making it more of a two human race in New Hampshire. And that's not the case. So that's a that's great. And then Vivek Ramaswamy drops out immediately and uh, officially becomes Trump's mini me on the campaign trail. Uh, and that's helpful for him, too. So it was uh, it was as good as it can be for Donald Trump. I think what you have to look at this race right now and realize is that it's going to be probably over in five weeks or at least the next five weeks will be determinative. If you have New Hampshire next week. Uh, and then you have South Carolina on uh, February 24th, I believe it is. Uh, and that's Nikki Haley's home state, of course. Um, New Hampshire, it is, she needs to win. Um, she needs to win something at some point. New Hampshire has one of the most independent electorates. It's easier for Democrats to come over and do shenanigans and vote in places. New Hampshire is also prickly. It doesn't like to be told by Iowa what to do. We've had the first poll that came out uh, today, the post Vivek and Chris Christie dropping out because remember Chris Christie was polling like 11% in New Hampshire. Um, and this is Boston Globe Suffolk, Suffolk. Uh, and it had Trump at 50, Nikki Haley at 34 and Ron DeSantis at five. Um, and if you look at the same poll back in September, Trump's at 49, you know, like it, mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's fascinating. Uh, one of the most interesting polls in this entire uh, season was one done by fair vote, right? The ranked choice people. And this is, I don't know, four, four months ago or something like that. And they took when the field was still wide and they took, uh, all of the candidates and they made everyone do ranked choice of them. And so what you find is that Donald Trump is the first choice by nearly half of the Republican electorate. He's also the last choice <laughs> by nearly half of the Republican electorate. So like, I forget exactly what the number was, but it's like, he started out like at 47% and then ranked mm -hmm. choice after you vote, you know, the loser on the island gets kicked off and then that person's votes uh, gets sort of a portion that keeps going. Trump couldn't get over 50 percent until it was just him and Nikki Haley at the end. Right. Because people kept ranking him last. They, he's a polarizing figure even within the Republican Party, let alone the rest of the country. So uh, Nikki Haley has really wanted this to be a two person race. It's still not. And that's going to be a little bit difficult for her. Um, she needs to win either New Hampshire and or South Carolina. Her home state. If she can't win South Carolina, then what is she even doing? And this would be the only other uh, mode for her to get in uh, if she indeed loses uh, in those next two, which I think is still the likeliest scenario. Although I think there's some hope that she might win 
for her uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, the other scenario is just that she comes in second place and something weird happens to Trump. Like, I don't know, he gets arrested and <laughs> not arrested, but he gets he gets convicted and he's in prison. And that affects the way that Republicans vote or I don't know what. It creates some kind of dynamic. And she's the one left with uh, the second uh, most number of delegates. But basically, you know, the Iowa confirmed that it is Donald Trump's party until we find out otherwise. Well, so in 2016, Donald Trump didn't win the Iowa caucuses, right? Right. That was Ted Cruz. What does his win this time by 51% tell us about this race and how this looks a little different than 2016? We've never seen anything like this in the Iowa caucuses, which have been going since 1976. Uh, People who, on when there's not an incumbent Republican president, uh, these caucuses are close. Like the biggest margin of victory before this week was in 1988 when uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Bob Dole, the not eventual nominee, uh, beat Pat Robertson, also the not eventual nominee, by like 12 percentage points. Trump wins by 30. That's just kind of huge. Uh, so it tells us that the Republican electorate is treating Trump like a quasi incumbent. Um, and uh, and that has remained the case for a long time. We've never seen in a contested primary, Harry Enten from CNN pointed this out earlier this week before the Iowa vote. Uh, we've never seen uh, in a non-incumbent race, uh, a, re- a Republican treated so much like an incumbent. So it's his to lose. Well, why should we be giving Iowans this much power in the first place, Matt Welch? Have we? Have we, Liz? I'm not sure. Um, like, like uh you know, it's the it's the perennial case of boy, these early states have a lot of power. Then they all jockey for various positions and and whatnot. Um, uh, these are the I, people who gave us tomato beer and handballs, right? Like, do we really trust these people with all of their well strange cultural proclivities? They haven't picked winners of the seven times that we've had non incumbents presidents running in Iowa. They've picked the winner twice. So yeah. uh, it's I remember not... President Santorum. It was a, a great <laughs> yeah. President Huckabee. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, actually, Ron Paul came came within an eyelash, and there was some yes. uh, like interpretation that he uh, actually came in first. But by the time they figured that out, it was several months too late. So no, it's not necessarily predictive, but that's just a huge margin, and there's a lot of copium being uh, uh, drank by people who don't want Trump trying to talk themselves out of what looks like it's his to lose unless you know, uh, unless there's a New Hampshire miracle. I do think that people are overreacting a little bit or they're they're precluding the possibility of New Hampshire uh, doing the New Hampshire thing. It's still a possibility. And, you know, Nikki Haley has has uh, narrowed the, the uh, margin by a lot in a short period of time there. So who knows? I say but all I assume of that the, the, the game, I, I assume like the, the game theory here is like, there's all the incentives for DeSantis and Haley to hang in there, right? Because of that X factor of Trump's, you know, legal troubles, I guess it's, it's going to coincide with super Tuesday. Uh, one of the cases, um, is that your expectation that, uh, you know, they're just going to hang in there just on that, no no matter what happens, just on that off chance that someone's got to be the nominee. DeSantis, his demeanor reminds me a lot of Rand Paul's demeanor in 2015 and 16 in the sense that Rand Paul was not having fun. And you could tell like uh, at some point we forget this now, but in 2014, kind of in the the prehistory of that election, Rand Paul was a front runner. He was uh, frequently ahead in polls and he seemed to have the wind at his sails. It was, we were living through the libertarian moment, the micro yes, moment when Liz times. Wolf was in diapers. Um, it I was, had a Rand Paul t-shirt and I must say there's like <laughs> some adorable photo of me from like my college days with like all my Rand Paul gear on. So I'll have to you excavate stand that. With as Rand. that yeah. is, oh, I stood, I stood with Rand. There's a lot of standing with Randing at uh, CPAC and, and elsewhere. <laughs> uh, but like he just had a miserable time. He was not having fun. DeSantis, you can tell he's not. I mean, he's just, uh, Zach, you know him a lot better as uh, as your governor, as America's yes. governor down in Florida. But like uh, he has, I think, even a different demeanor as governor than he does as a presidential candidate. And there's been a lot of reporting coming out just like that. I mean, they, they blew through a ton of money. They bet it all on Iowa and he barely squeaked one out against Nikki Haley. He's polling right now. That same poll has him at five percent. 
the Boston Globe Suffolk poll. And, and, you know, that's after they've wiped out Vivek and Chris Christie. Um, so who knows whether I, you know, if he gets 5% of the vote in New Hampshire, that's an awful, uh, that's an awful low amount to get excited about campaigning for another three weeks. I think it's plausible that he drops out then. I mean, it must be really hard stuffing his feet into those uh, cowboy boots with lifts every single day. You know, I can understand feeling a little exhausted by all of that. If you're going to use them to dance a little bit, like some Cuban heels, there's no problem at all. But if it's just like, I want to be taller, then that's no good. Or man. Uh, I do want to understand, Matt, you've been studying the Libertarian Party in all of its different incarnations for many, many years now. Where do you think libertarians are likely to cluster now, given the sort of weird and changing presidential field? Uh, we have no idea. And it's also like a small L and capital L are different things. I mean, small L libertarians, like those of us with libertarian persuasions who may or may not be miffed by the direction of the LP. The uh, It's funny, you know, uh, the people who uh, know about the direction of the LP, right, who know about the Mises caucus uh, self-described takeover that happened that Zach uh, covered so well um, in the past and, and on, in an ongoing basis, really, um, that is known by people like us who are very online libertarians. I'm not sure that it's known by the 750,000 Americans who are registered as libertarians, which is, by the way, three times the number as it was 20 years ago, um, which is pretty significant. Libertarians are on a uh, three presidential election bronze medal streak, uh, which is definitely a tallest dwarf category uh, situation. But also, like, we haven't seen any party do that since the 19th century when it was the socialists. Um, so by far, they will have the most... Uh, uh, presidential ballot access of any third party. Um, it's, it remains to be seen what happens with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, and how many uh, ballots he gets. He's doing a mix of his own name and, and like hijacking or creating other parties to get on there. And I think all of that is one of the, um, the most underrated part of this uh, campaign. I, I presume that we're going to see a lot more thought and activity about that in the very near future. Certainly, um, uh, depending on what happens to Nikki Haley in the next uh, two main uh, uh, primaries. Nevada has a caucus and she's not even competing. Um, but uh, there, there is such a huge sentiment. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is polling at 15%. Uh, that's crazy. We haven't seen that at, from an independent since Ross Perot. Um, you still have Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson uh, polling combined above 10% against Joe Biden and no one's paying any attention to them at all. Um, there's even an outside chance that Dean Phillips might uh, might be a thorn in Biden's side in New Hampshire. It's all weird with the right and stuff. Uh, there's all this uh, ferment happening. Americans hate this election and they have from the beginning. And it's it's now looking even more like the thing that they wanted to hate. Both Biden and Trump are underwater among independents who were always the swing vote in presidential elections. Um, Biden won last time, and people uh, tend to forget this. He won because the people who voted third party in 2016, uh, the majority of whom were libertarians, voting or at least voted libertarians, uh, he won because those people didn't vote for third party, they voted for him. Um, the, the percentage of the third party vote in 2016 was 5.7. Uh, in uh, 2020, it was 1.8. And yeah. what did the Democrat do uh, compared to Hillary Clinton? He went up by three percentage points. So it's pretty clear that's what happened. People freaked out about Trump. They didn't like him. Independents soured on Trump from the moment he was elected, just as they have with Biden, by the way. Biden uh, actually had a higher ranking among independents when he was inaugurated, like 61 percent. And then it plunged to 34 within six months. Um, and it, it remains there. So when we talk about where libertarians going to vote, um, we have to, I think, um, understand that uh, libertarians, at least for the last three presidential elections, they just kind of vote libertarian. I'm not sure how much they know uh, that there's all these feuds within uh, Mises caucus and non-Mises caucus. There's lawsuits at the state party level and all this kind of stuff. It might be something that interests them, and it might also be something that they haven't even begun to hear about and that they have just created their own political identity as libertarians. And if they see that word on a ballot, they'll go, okay, I vote for that. Um, so we don't know.
my so my observation of the very online libertarians was a decent amount of enthusiasm for Vivek. Um, I mean, I ran an informal poll on my Twitter, so take that for what it's worth. And he was the kind of, uh, you know, plurality getter on, uh, you know, who is there, like w which candidate would uh, be most beneficial to your personal liberty. Um, and it just kind of confirmed what I'd been seeing a lot, uh, a bunch uh, among a lot of online libertarians. Um, now that Vivek is out, uh, what do you make of that, that Vivek love among a certain segment of the libertarian movement? Uh, what do you think accounts for it and where might it go? Well, I mean, he wants it to go to Donald Trump, obviously. He's now asking, yes, uh, demanding. I don't think it's going to necessarily. Um, well, it's not that he has a, a large following to begin with. You know, he's polling nationally like four or five uh, percent in a Republican primary. The Iowa, uh, the Libertarian Party did do like an Iowa caucus thing. There's a very small number of votes. But yeah, um, I uh, pulled that up too. I'll pull that up for you. Uh, Chase Oliver got the most. Chase Oliver, that's an underrated story, right? Um, in that yeah. uh, people have been talking about the Mises caucus takeover and this and that and the other. Chase Oliver, to my knowledge, and I haven't been following the LP very closely so far this cycle, he's not a Mises caucus guy. That's not where he's coming off like. He's a two time yeah. candidate who's pushed a, a, a Democratic Republican uh, elections in Georgia into runoffs twice. Um, he seems to sort of clean up and present pretty well as a former military, I, I believe. Um, but that poll is also interesting because Vivek Ramaswamy got four times as many votes as Jacob Hornberger. Uh, Jacob Hornberger, who last time was the runner up in the Libertarian Party, he was and he was also the Mises caucus choice or at least the um, by, you know, compared to Joe Jorgensen. And, and she won uh, kind of. Uh, come from behind victory against Jacob Hornberger. Uh, this could be just an outlier and it, it could, you know, there was uh, talk of that Vivek's name got on that ballot through a, an odd way to begin with. Um, yeah. Yes. He, and I some... saw some math whiz figuring out that uh, if that those like 1%, 1.1% .1 uh, numbers represent like one vote that about like 89 people voted in this. Yeah. Out yeah. Of, uh, 99 counties. So it, yeah. So you know, it's, we... it, it should be grains of salt, but there yeah. are dozens of us, dozens, dozens, right? literal dozens. Uh, Vivek, Vivek says things that some people like to hear, which is that, um, you know, January 6th was an inside job and that the election of 2020 is stolen. Of course, that's in direct contradiction to what he said about the 2020 election literally 14 months ago, which was that people who are uh, complaining that it's stolen don't have any evidence and that they're they're uh, it, the ones drinking copium uh, and then it's unseemly and they're becoming the grand old party of crybabies. But, you know, whatever, we all we all change with new data, I guess. Um, uh, th there are people who like that and also like his very like bold, provocative ideas about foreign policy, sort of a radical semi anti-war or anti-U.S. intervention, depending on how you look at it type of things like uh, he will negotiate with Vladimir Putin to give chunks of Ukraine. Uh, to Russia in return for making sure that Russia and China don't cooperate. And if they do break that, then Ukraine goes into NATO. And I guess there's an audience for that. Um, uh, what do you I, make of that audience arguments not like me. that? Like, what, like, tear that argument apart for me, because it seems um, a little bit, Josh Barrow has the great piece about, I believe it's Josh Barrow, about how Vivek is basically section guy. Um, at any fancy school, <laughs> you always see these people in college, the people who are always in a hurry to raise their hand, and they think they know the answers to absolutely everything. And there's this um, this ego, this narcissism, this sense of hubris and that they have all the answers to everything. When I look at Vivek's typically Twitter posts on foreign policy that talk about how actually he'll just solve China uh, and he'll just make it so Putin and China cooperate, blah, 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 it always strikes me as I don't know, like a 19 year old LARPing as a foreign policy expert. Matt, you have way more yeah. experience in this. What do you make of it? I just no president has the magic wand. Um, and we should have learned that from Donald Trump. Um, of all things, I mean, uh, you know, he was going to use the magic wand to build a wall or, you know, extend the wall uh, on the southern border. And it extended somewhat, but the magic wand doesn't exist. It's hard to get stuff done. And it's hardest of all to get stuff done in the international arena. So the less that you know about it and the more that you're going in there with instinct rather or just, you know, a feeling, a vibe 
rather than knowledge of how powers interact with one another, the more that someone uh, imagining a magic wand sounds great. Um, and without and without like a, a backup plan. I mean, we're living in a populist moment in the United States and in the globe, and we have been for about ten years. And there's a lot of the part of that instinct is a correct one, in my view, which is that the way that the world is ordered um, doesn't have as much democratic legitimacy. It seems to be happening regardless of whether one wants it or not. That's the always the fertile ground for conspiratorial thinking, and I, I use that non-pejoratively in this case, um, uh, if you're trying to figure out why this policy or these conditions, these decisions keep happening and your vote has nothing to do with it, your your attitudes have nothing to do with it, then you start developing some theories uh, about that because it seems like you, you are powerless. I mean, you see this a lot in Western Europe, for example, because the world order is something that Western Europe hasn't had a lot of influence on. It's the United States that pretty much has the most influence on it. And so the average French person is going to think uh, all kinds of conspiratorial things about um, how these decisions get made and where and by who. Um, so Vivek plays into that or like he taps into that, I should say, uh, that sentiment, that feeling like if we just withdraw from NATO and if we just do this, do this, then something that has never been uh, thought of before can happen. Um, it's just naive. It's not how structures and parties work. I, I would say like one way of thinking about it is um, uh, is Brexit, right? Brexit makes total sense from just like a sovereignty kind of point of view, right? Um, and the people who were pushing Brexit had all kinds of very uh, naive ideas about what would happen afterwards. Um, they actually didn't have a very good plan for that. And then Brexit's still kind of a big mess afterwards. And the results were not what the people who were pushing for it promised or wanted. Um, it's a lot easier to say, you know, to quote Steve Martin, I break with the, I break with the, and you throw dog poop on somebody's shoes than it is to build what replaces the post-World War II order. Um, so if your instinct is like, well, just fuck that order, um, then, then Vivek Ramaswamy is good. And there's a lot of people who have that instinct um, and, uh, and would rather just express that than try to construct what comes next. I think the the populism question is central to understanding kind of libertarianism right now in 2023. We had this conversation. Uh, we went into this topic with Dave Smith on the first episode of the show, um, and I wanted to just play a little bit of Dave's argue. He, he's very much in the pro-populism camp. And this is a debate that stretches back to kind of the beginnings of modern American libertarianism. Uh, let's have, I want to have Dave articulate his case for libertarian populism and then kind of delve a little more deeply into this. So let's roll that, Bess. I'm a big believer in the Rothbardian kind of like populist idea that, and look, I think you see this with uh, Javier Malay, right? Like this is the way it can be done. Like this is the way to do it is to tap into the, this, this kind of populist streak, particularly at a time when the elites have so mismanaged everything and kind of like talk to people about how they are being ripped off. Uh, so uh, I think that got cut off a little early. Well, let's keep, it uh, looks like it yeah, ripped we off froze. There we go. So, um, uh, I mean, what what do you think of that uh, that argument that um, you know at at the end of the day there are uh, there there is a sort of you know managerial elite or at least uh, 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 people who have that ambition to uh, plan our society and that libertarians should be defining themselves in opposition to that agenda i think a lot of things about that um one is that i should uh, always preface that uh my job uh or my self-conception um uh is not about the wielding of political the attainment or the wielding of political power uh, and so when i uh, am asked about, you know, how should we attain and wield political power? I don't have great answers, or at least you should take them with all the grain of salt. My job is to do journalism, uh, libertarian journalism. Um, uh, a lot of that can be very righteous and angry and frothing and pointing out the just brutal mismanagement 
by the elite political class. It's a huge percentage of what we do at Reason uh, and what I've done in my life before. And uh, I ever uh, worked for Reason or really knew much about the place. Um, so it's part of it, yeah, but uh, also journalism is just a different thing. It's, it's, a, it's gathering of facts. I would point to if we're going to be talking about Marie Rothbard's strategy as being something that that is helpful, um, you should point out that um, it wasn't always helpful. The uh, Marie Rothbard went to some bad places in the early 1990s. Um, uh, th that is what happens when you go towards the attainment of political party and also uh, power and also like this sort of attempt. And, and there's something elite about the this uh, attempt as well, or at least uh, not elite. It's it's like uh, it's a it's a temptation that intellectuals and people who work in the knowledge class um, always are tempted by, which is that if I can just harness this populist feeling out there, I'm going to produce my intellectual ideological outcome. Um, yeah. You see this with uh, with Marie Rothbard and Lou Rockwell in the early 1990s with the Roth Rockwell Rothbard report. Uh, they were talking about Joe Senator Joe McCarthy, tailgunner Joe, as being a role model. They were saying nice things about David Duke. Um, they cozied up to Pat Buchanan um, uh, at the time as a kind of predictive element of where a segment of the population was going to go as as a sort of John the Baptist figures. Uh, for Donald Trump, they were onto something, absolutely. And they were onto something much more than I certainly expected. So hats off for, you know, sort of like uh, describing a, a world as it exists rather than the world than I thought it was. Um, but as a, uh, a a place where a person can go um, and uh, and like and hold on to one's libertarianism or one's ideology, it was corrupting. Those types of things are corrupting. Uh, it's going to lead you to positions like Lou Rockwell had of like defending the cops against Rodney King, of writing just really horrible things. Like the the early 1990s stuff that came, uh, whether it's in the Ron Paul newsletters or the, or the Rothbard Rockwell report and all these kind of things, it's, it's very noxious. It's very anti-libertarian. Um, uh, it went to a bad place. Uh, and you could say that admiring Ro uh, uh, Rothbard for plenty of other things that he uh, contributed in his life. But he was always kind of a political schemer. Um, one way to look at this and take Rothbard and take libertarian politics out of this for a second is um, look at the difference between what, what Chris Rufo does and what, uh, uh, for instance, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education does. They are always at loggerheads, even though they frequently have the same kind of uh, opponents in the world. It's just a different mm -hmm. approach. Uh, FIRE um, uses a, they're sort of tethered to a set of principles which they apply, hopefully, uh, and in, in my uh, view, uh, usually, um, very consistently uh, across time. Rufo is is going towards power, um, political power, like Ron DeSantis in Florida, and trying to influence it. I think both approaches are valid, by the way, and I think, uh, like, absolutely, Chris Rufo has influenced uh, American policy and debate more than a lot of private actors have for a long time. Um, but I think it is also corrupting. You're going to lead to bad laws, which I think some of that ha has happened in Florida. So um, it's uh, libertarian popular. I think libertarian is naturally populist in that sense. It is a, a position from which you critique the application of power and you correctly identify that, especially those people who say that, oh, we're just over here like trying to solve problems, that that is actually ideological, even uh, as much or more ideologically or more influentially ideological than libertarianism is. And yeah, Javier Malay going afuera a bunch and ripping stuff off of a wall is awesome. I would love to see that as I would love to see someone uh, articulate in the way that he has in those videos that we've all seen talking about economics and just rapid fire insane you know, Nick Gillespie on, on crank, uh, kind of mode. That's, that's all thrilling and exciting, but let's also remember, um, the conditions that brought him, uh, were so horrible and I hope we don't live to see them in this country. Would it, yeah. Would and there's a, uh, it's, it's also, it's also, t uh, you know, targeted at a, the, from a libertarian perspective, it's grounded. It, we talked about this with Dave too. It's grounded in libertarian theory. And he is, when he's, you know, saying afuera and, and ripping things off, he's talking about dismantling unnecessary government bureaucracies, which all of us in this conversation agree with. And like, when I think about populism, um, I, I, I agree largely with what you're saying, Matt, that there's a sort of 
cynicism to libertarians embracing it uh, because populism can almost be its own uh, ideology. It's like it is the belief that there is just that elites um, themselves are kind of inherently bad. And I think for libertarians, it's like, well, no, it's more like people who are using their elite status to infringe on others liberties are bad like in a, in a free society there you know we would have you know academics and we would have uh you know titans of industry and so forth. like so there there would be kind of like natural el elites so we're we're not against that necessarily but uh we're against natural like, elites Zach Weissmuller well we're we're against like uh you know the Klaus Schwabs of the world uh who is himself defining uh, himself against libertarian. He he said, you know, libertarians, these anti-system people, are the enemy. Um, and so, you know, I I have no problem being kind of like creeped out by like the the dastardly plans of the World Economic Forum, even though I don't think that you know they're they're out there you know eating babies. Uh, that but they they sure. want to they 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 have a vision. They have the a kind of you know, technocratic vision of the world. They have this this idea that um, it, you know we're we're gonna kind of meld uh, public and private, and we're we're you know have we're gonna have stakeholder capitalism. We're gonna kind of go the China model. That that is something to be alarmed about and worried about. And and to the degree that you know resisting that is quote unquote populism, fine. But this kind of unmoored populism and, and appealing to just like a, a in a vague sense of uh the, the elites are are controlling everything I, I think that is where we start to run into to big problems well wouldn't libertarian populists counter to both of you because i i do want to sort of play devil's advocate for a second here i think i agree with what you guys are saying but wouldn't the libertarian populists if one were in the room with us counter Zach, they shut you inside your house in Los Angeles for, you know, a, a really long time to the point where you felt the need to move your entire family to Florida to ensure your kids didn't grow up masked. Matt, you know, same for you in New York City. I mean, you have basically been betrayed by the state that has locked you inside your houses for many months on end and basically removed public schools as an option available to your children. What has the state done for you? And done Liz... And yeah. Liz, they blocked you from going to church, right? Well, I yeah, mean, I mean, legitimately they blocked people from going to church. That is yeah. such a radicalizing notion. I mean, just but for cutting a long off time, the community. They did all of this to us. And then they basically said, you know, Matt and Liz, in order to possibly enter a New York City restaurant uh, with your family, you have to show proof that you've gotten the vaccine a bunch of times at a certain point, right? Because they required multiple doses. Oh, and then by the way, Zach, those questions you had about the origins of this whole virus and whether or not there was a lab leak, well, actually we're going to censor and suppress a whole bunch of information, journalistic information that attempts to get to the bottom of this, even though it's all happened in China, you know, where the CCP, sorry, I did my best Donald Trump-esque China, but like where the CCP, More we know syllables. it's not generally transparent with us, right? Like, yeah. so when you, well, when you tally up what they've done to us over the last four or so years, not to mention every single year, they take hefty, hefty chunks of our paychecks. How could you not hate the state? Like at a well, certain point, yeah, radical. Well, it's not. Yeah, it's it's not about that. It, and let uh, let me just give one counter to that. And I, I'm curious to hear Matt weigh in on this. But, you know, when you talk about they locked me down in Los Angeles. It was basically one person named Barbara Ferrer, who was the <laughs> public health authority uh, for LA County, who's like a, a, you know, a master's of public health or something like that. And then who was it that ultimately declared that, uh, you know, locking people out of their churches was unconstitutional. It was a bunch of robed elites from Ivy League, uh, from the Ivy League, uh, sitting on the Supreme Court. So it's not as simple as like the elites versus the non-elites are, are on your side or, or not on your side. And and that's, I guess, my point is like we should be looking more at what is what are the mechanisms for these infringements rather than like what kind of strata of 
society or culture is it coming from? But I do think it is worth pointing out that like Barbara Farrar and, you know, big city mayors, um, whether Garcetti or de Blasio, were all taking their cues from Anthony Fauci and then the teachers unions and Randy Weingarten, who Matt has written about extensively, right? Like to some degree, there was a level of uh, coordination, maybe not in the sort of sense that people envision of like, well, the deep state uh, is conspiring against us. But there is certainly, a, well, the CDC says one thing and Anthony Fauci says one thing, and then all of these big city mayors take their cues from that and so on and so forth. Matt, what do you make of all this? That um, is, I mean, I've always used the phrase political class in that in, in many cases, and this is absolutely true. And it was a, an actual conspiracy in that people met together and made decisions. I mean, the, the classic case is the February 2021 new Biden administration guidelines at the CDC about distancing in, in public schools, uh, where the new uh, CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, made a recommendation that was counter to her own personal recommendation of the summer previously when she was a private citizen uh, because um, she had Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, in on those scientific discussions. And since a huge swath of the country, the one run by Democrats for the most part, basically uh, followed CDC diktat on uh, these things, that meant that sentenced kids to further time in halftime or remote schooling and there was a revolt uh, that happened uh, in Massachusetts and elsewhere, and they had to scramble and revise those calculations a month later. Um, but it showed that that thing was was corrupted from from root and branch. And yes, the the elites and this and I would include here the journalistic class too as part of the political class. Right now, you have a large swath of journalism dumb who are cheering on censorship by the Biden administration. Like we have to combat COVID mis misinformation. And if that means, you know, taking Joe Rogan off Spotify, well, darn it, that's just what we've got to do. It's insane. Um, and we should have contempt towards that. Um, I would just say in my own little hippie corner over here, we just had Martin Luther King Day here. And I'm always glad to see people look up his various writings and speechings about everything. And, and I've always been, I think the perhaps greatest or certainly, you know, top five pieces of American uh, political writing and rhetoric is letter from Birmingham jail, which has the four steps, essential steps in his position or his, his point of view uh, uh, towards uh, creating a nonviolent campaign of, uh, of a nonviolent um, resistance. And uh, th two of those steps are always, uh, kind of overlooked, uh, but one of them is the uh, gathering of facts, right? Not fictions, but facts. Uh, the other one is self-purification, um, which is to say, um, if your heart is filled with hate, you're going to do bad at, at at doing persuasive, convincing protest. So um, I have contempt for a lot of the actions that you described, Liz, and even you bringing them up again makes the blood pressure kind of go up and, and get all prickly. Um, and I try not to be governed by hate. I don't think uh, encouraging people to hate the state is going to lead to great outcomes, but that's just me personally. Um, and again, I'm not uh, in the power wielding business. Um, I know that if I'm governed by hate uh, of, you know, the protesters blocking the Williamsburg Bridge when I want to cross it, um, that I'm probably going to get to some bad policy ideas. So I try to not do it. You know, so speak, uh, reflecting on that that message of nonviolence for a second, and and how uh, kind of important that is to you. Um, what one of the the political predictions that you've publicly made, Matt, is that there's going to be some sort of political violence unfolding this year, um, or and at least you're you're worried that that's going to happen, um, and part of that. Uh, seems to come down to how people view what has transpired in this country over the past four or five years. Um, specifically, you know, the the touchstone there is January 6th. And you, you wrote a, a piece that I think drew a lot of fire uh, calling out uh, Vivek Ramaswamy's comments on January 6th. Let me pull that up here. The headline is Vivek Ramaswamy really, really wants you to know he thinks January 6th was an inside job. Um, and uh, I highlighted a, a passage from here. This is what Vivek had to say about January 6th. There's now clear evidence that there was 
at the very least entrapment of peaceful protesters similar to the fake Gretchen Witcher Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping plot. The FBI won't admit how many undercover officers there were in the field on January 6. Capitol Police on one hand fired rubber bullets and explosives into a peaceful crowd who then then they willingly later allowed to enter the Capitol. That doesn't add up. If the deep state is willing to manufacture an insurrection to take down its political opponents, they can do anything. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. What is the fundamental problem with uh, Ramaswamy's formulation there? And um, what are your worries about how this kind of increasingly, uh, that, 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 that if this formulation is increasingly accepted or, or embraced by mainstream political figures, how, how, what effect um, are you worried that that's going to have on American civil life? That is not clear evidence of entrapment or the manufacture of an insurrection. It is not. It is not. That's not clear evidence of that. Um, you like show me the clear evidence. It's the beginning. Noting that there are um, there's been an admission that at least a handful of FBI informants were uh, in the field that day. Um, and that's by the FBI uh, in hearings uh, over the summer. Um, uh, noting that is not clear evidence. It is the beginning of a series of questions, um, and those questions then should lead you to where uh, the next place that you would find evidence for this, especially if you're going to say that this is very similar to the Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping, uh, in which, like so many cases after 9-11, the FBI had people, uh, like uh, people who were pretending to be people that they were not, not just informants, not just sort of like uh, like uh, saying, hey, these guys over here are doing it. They, they were cooking up the plot themselves to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, a plot that was never going to happen. It's private among a small group of uh, somewhat gullible people. Uh, we've seen this over and over again. We've written about this over and over again at Reason, uh, including back uh, long before Vivek Ramaswamy uh, expressed any interest in the subject in any kind of public way. Um, so uh, the next place that you would look in a place like Gretchen Whitmer is like, okay, um, is testimony from those people part of the charging documents in the case? Um, uh, is it part of the criminal conviction when it goes to trial? In those entrapment cases, they were. And that is typically how that goes. That's how we learn about it. That's how, in the case of Michigan, uh, some of those charges were thrown out, although they were then retried. Um, in the 889 convictions that have happened uh, related to the January 6th riots in Capitol Hill, uh, 200 of which involved violent activity, um, there has been zero cases, as far as we know, as far as I'm aware of, um, in which that showed up in the charging documents and that was part of the trial. Testimony, evidence from agents, provocateurs, informants in the field. Um, so if this is clear evidence, it would show some fingerprints somewhere, unless uh, I'm still holding out the possibility here, in general, like we should suspect the FBI having a default suspicion and a deep one is yeah. totally fine. So then uh, where do you look? So the way that that uh, you can imagine that this was um, uh, th that we wouldn't need to use that testimony that could have been there is just by simply um, that the actions of the people, um, you know, charging through barricades, uh, causing injury to more than 100 Capitol Police, um, that their actions alone were enough to convict them. But that should lead you to, and so therefore they didn't need this testimony, even though they could have totally done it. But that should lead you to another conclusion, which is to say the way that you avoid that kind of entrapment, and let's remember that since I wrote that article, uh, Vivek has now called January 6th um, Entrapment Day. Um, the way to avoid a, a, entrapment is to not uh, bust through barricades and break windows and fight with Capitol Police officers while trying to enter the Capitol building um, on the day that they're supposed to be certifying the president election. You could totally avoid it by not doing any of those things. And I don't say that cheekily, and I don't say that in a way yeah. to be like high-fiving these grossly long sentences of various Proud Boys members. I don't think that the insurrection um, uh, the sedition charges. I, I don't think that, that those were appropriate. I think they're way too long. Um, I, I agree with Vivek Ramaswamy that people who are nonviolent shouldn't be serving prison for their activities on that day. Um, I agree with him. 
Uh, so, uh, but it's not clear evidence of entrapment. It just isn't. And, uh, yeah. and he also said that the Capitol police are just the same as the FBI. No, they're not. They're different. They're actually different uh, organizations. Um, and if the Capitol police and the other two things that he's pointing to as, as clear bits of evidence were like, well, look, um, they, you know, they did tear gas and rubber bullets over here, although very small amounts. Um, um, but they let in you know, the barricades over here. So look, they're just like letting them right in. That doesn't add up. Well, it's a chaotic scene. If you have a, if you, anyone who has been in a riot knows that it doesn't add up. Riots are crazy yeah. moments. Like everyone is acting in strange ways. And if the Capitol Hill police were in on it, that means that they ushered in. First of all, that means that all of the interviews that have been done with them, they all managed to just sort of like, um, uh, be completely disciplined about not spilling the beans on the worst day in the history of the Capitol police. They're like, oh, okay, we'll just totally swallow this conspiracy. Yeah. It's hard not a to single imagine. whistleblower. Yeah. So, How many but people to, but, would have to be in cahoots for all of this to add up, right? Like, uh, it would have to be hundreds and hundreds of people who've all perfectly synced up their stories with not a crack in sight and not even anybody privately sort of admitting to their groups of friends what's what, right? I, I do want that to get to the, to the beginning of Zach's question, which is yeah, um, because it's not one sided, it's not just January 6th is my uh worry about violence. The way that I'm worried about violence related to January 6th is that it is clear that the Republican Party, uh, the mainstream of the Republican Party is not taking responsibility for January 6th. Um, uh, like clear majorities when you poll Republicans, either blame it like on Antifa or the FBI or Ray Epps or whoever's in their imagination who did it, uh, or they say, yeah, it's fine. Um, like it's justified because Biden stole the election. So like, that's not taking responsibility for human action at all. You have to like own the agency of it one way or the other in my estimation, or else you are basically intellectually green lighting further violence. And on the left, that is the same um, in different ways, but that overall dynamic is the same with the 2020 uh, post George Floyd riots, which killed, you know, 14, 19 people. I forget the, the exact number, huge amounts of damage. And not just that, but Portland was on fire for a hundred consecutive days. People were just like, uh, you know, besieging and throwing human shit uh, at the uh, police building in downtown Portland over and over. There's burning stuff day after day. We boarded up New York City, Manhattan, which I don't think is a Trump, uh, a, a, a you know, a big Trump uh, supporting region. We put plywood on windows here because we assumed that if Trump won, the people who didn't like him would riot. So that says to me that we've normalized a lot of political violence and the post October 7th demonstrations, which I mentioned before, which do irritate me to great effect because it it keeps me from getting home. Uh, and that's that's just no good. Um, if we're allowing small groups of raggedy ass protesters to close bridges to uh, prompt the evacuation of the White House, which happened the other day, um, that says to me that we haven't thought we haven't come up with a plan on what to do. If you uh, behavior that gets rewarded, gets repeated in the famous formulation. And so if that all it takes is a couple of uh, beardies and some college dropouts to block a bridge that, well, that seems fun. Let's block yeah. O'Hare airport. Yeah. Let's the snaggle worst LAX. Thing, the worst thing is that they're not college dropouts. They in fact graduated from their liberal arts schools and now want uh, loan forgiveness from the rest of us. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's important to note that. But I, I do also, I, I was confused by the boarding up of windows all up and down Fifth Avenue um, on election day uh, this past go around as well, especially because one of the things that was most striking to me was that sleep number, the mattress store was boarded up. And I'm a little bit like, were you seriously expecting the looting of mattresses um, <laughs> in Manhattan? Like, how exactly was that going to go? Like, I, please play this out for me. But I you're think, yeah, you, get, you get tired and like from a, a long uh, <laughs> night of rioting and need a little rest. But I think your point is well taken. And I think it, you, your writing on this actually kind of at least shakes me out of this mindset where since this has just been the state of play for the last, I don't know, frankly, since 2020, summer of 2020, post George Floyd, it was very much normalized. Uh, but even before that, a little bit, we saw Zach and I were just talking recently about all of the... Um, you know, carnage in Ferguson, Missouri, and basically how that was sort of, you know, obviously there have been different waves of protests. LA in the 90s is another good example that you mentioned earlier. There have been these waves of protests and riots that have popped up, but to some degree, I kind of feel like from 2014, and then we had a little pause when things were kind of good and decent from 2016 to 2020, and then 2020 up until now, 
these eras where it feels like small groups of people exerting extraordinary influence um, and really affecting other people's abilities to live their lives, uh, people, you know, shopkeepers' abilities to actually uh, earn a living for themselves, people's abilities to go out their business unmolested. It's kind of increasingly rare. And it's it's important to kind of whip our heads, snap our heads out of this and remember living in such a politically tumultuous era is not a normal thing. This is not aspirational. This is not good. This is not how every single era has totally been, though obviously there have been these waves of it. But at least for the last four years, the fact that this is, at least to me, feels like a fact of life is a hugely problematic thing where it does feel like political violence is sort of increasingly... Um, it's like we increasingly act like if it's for the right cause, it's no big deal. And actually, it's yeah. really important to say no, no matter it, the cause, it's a really fucking big deal. Yeah. I think that's the key point is that the the excusing of it, but the, the and the cowardice from political leaders to condemn political violence, uh, if it's coming from your side, more or less, that, that's what we're what Matt is describing with January 6th. That's what we saw with these riots and uh, that that denying of uh, personal agency, which I would think is something that libertarians would be particularly attuned to and and able to recognize like the importance of agency and responsibility. But I I do think it's becoming an increasingly unbridgeable divide among libertarians uh, and other small government types who more or less believe what Ramaswamy says about January 6 and the lead up to it and those of us who think there's there might be some shadiness there might have been some egging on but don't see the evidence of some massive setup and that's not even to say that the entire insurrection framing or narrative is exactly right either i i just think there's a there's a lot of contributing factors and and blame to go around which you can trace all the way back to if you wanted the beginnings of the Trump administration and the Russia investigation and the 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 discontent, uh, I think a lot of it uh, legitimate about how that was handled, the outrageous the, the the lies and the bad policy around COVID, the media, the the political hypocrisy and defenses of looting. It's that it's all a valid discussion, but if one of us believes that January six was a manufactured plot to stop us from discovering the truth and the other just doesn't see the evidence for that. It's it's such a different view of reality. And I just wonder like, can, can people that, that have those two different views even really be in a political coalition together? Sure. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, part, part of me hears you uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, I try to figure out what's going on and and I uh, will confess to occasionally writing with at least a little bit of mild irritation when I chase down someone's uh, statement down a rabbit hole and like really spend a long time to try to figure out whether it's true and discover yeah. that there's that it's just based on not much. I did that like a nine months ago when uh, RFK Jr. was saying that basically Tr- uh, Tucker Carlson was bounced off Fox because he took on Big Pharma. Um, and, uh, and you know, I wrote a thing that no one cared about, um, like going into it just because it was so frustratingly wrong um, and and indicative of a, of, a, of a different mindset. And yet, Zach Weissmuller, I think you should smoke more pot like Liz Wolf does. And um, that, you know, there's always unbridgeable divides, like 60% of Americans, including Jacob Horber, I think he's written like a couple of books on this, uh, leading Libertarian Party candidate, uh, believe that there is a JFK uh, conspiracy um, uh, beyond that, you know, the communist guy shot him. Um, and, uh, I don't, but does that mean I can't agree with Jacob Hornberger and maybe, you know, would I vote for him if he's on my uh, ballot in New York? I would, uh, yeah, I would vote for Jacob Hornberger. But isn't that we, a totally different situation? Because that's like one discreet long ago example, No, it's, as opposed I, to this like massive political undercurrent, this political thing that's still happening. I get what you're saying. Uh, I'm just, I'm like, 
people you could have like used the phrase unbridgeable divide in the 1970s to describe so very damn much the 70s as bad as what we're having now and as as like as many palpitations as i feel about i think the inevitable deadly political violence of this year and and political violence it's just it it is more traumatic than than a political violence um uh, not necessarily to the people who experience it, but the, to the country at large, because you could sort of see it coming out when the Proud Boys and Antifa are engaging in street battles, as happened throughout the Trump administration, not just in 2020. Um, there's something that's, you know, the idea of like a street political street gangs. We're right to be freaked out by that. But uh, the seventies were worse by a lot. There was just hijackings and bombings like on a daily basis that were very explicitly political. And what happened to a lot of those people who were just like, they went bonkers, just joining the weather underground, um, doing uh, like the various schismatics between the, in the black Panther party, just like a lot of just murdering going on. People kind of like eventually went jogging by the late seventies and like came out of it as college professors and they stopped murdering people and doing bombs and hijackings. Uh, people are able to come out of it and there's always going to be in, and I've said this many times. Um, and, and, and I never mean this pejoratively again, but in marginal political movements, and this is sort of just a description of its existence within the mainstream and libertarianism is marginal in that sense. Mm -hmm. Um, it's going to attract marginal people people who believe all kinds of interesting, weird things. And I am one of those people. I am marginal. Um, and there are things that I believe that are crazy. I'm sure of it. Um, like, so, what? um, mm, I have a whole conspiracy related to Bob Woodward that I'm not, uh, at, at liberty to, uh, discuss <laughs> at large flight 800 too. I'm uh, pretty big on that one too. Really? Um, uh, yeah, you bet. Um, but, uh, no, like it just, there's going to be people who tend toward the conspiratorial bent within the libertarian camp. That doesn't mean that I cannot break bread with them and agree with them on ad hoc basis of things. I'm again, not in, I'm not organizing a libertarian political party here. Um, I yeah. don't, uh, I I'm so like, I don't get as, uh, as frustrated as you sound with the, uh, sense of the un unbridgeable divide. I just take it as a given that my little, thread of the world is going to be a very very lonely place and yeah. uh, and i also don't care what anyone thinks about it. i mean i guess part of my frustration is that i would like to see libertarianism move from the margins um and it seemed for a while that there was some momentum to that uh to that end um and you know i i want us to to get you know a a, a serious uh, movement before we get to the point of, you know, needing a, a wild Javier Malay to swoop in because we, we don't like, uh, uh, like you said before, we don't want to ever get to that point where, where we need to, where we're dealing with triple digit inflation and kind of just like rampant political corruption. Um, it, but, but like, as I was pondering this, this question of like, wh where is the libertarian movement right now? And like, where are they going to settle uh, in terms of candidates or, you know, and, and like, are libertarians even going to matter in this election? Um, one thing that was that popped out uh, to me that, that was interesting was this video that uh, Rand Paul put out, who's an avatar of a certain kind of libertarianism. And he wouldn't commit to any candidates, but he will commit to being never Nikki, which is uh, never Nikki Haley, which is kind of interesting to me in itself that like he that he won't land anywhere, but he can define himself as against something. So I, I want to play just a, a, a short bit from his never Nikki video and then ask you to react to the message that Rand Paul's putting out there. Let's roll that. Good morning, everyone. As I told you yesterday, I'm ready to say something about the presidential race. I've had a long relationship with Donald Trump, and there's a lot to like there. I'm also a big fan of a lot of the fiscal conservatism of Ron DeSantis. I think Vivek Ramaswamy has been a, an important voice. Also, have listened to and met with the independent Bobby Kennedy. I'm not yet ready to make a decision, but I am ready to make a decision on someone who I cannot support 
So I'm announcing this morning that I'm never Nikki. I don't think any informed or knowledgeable libertarian or conservative should support Nikki Haley. I've seen her attitude towards our, invent, our interventions overseas. I've seen her involvement in the military industrial complex, $8 million being paid to become part of the team. But I've also seen her indicate that she thinks you should be registered to use the internet, that people posting ideas anonymously. I think she fails to understand that our republic was founded upon people like Ben Franklin, Sam Adams, Madison, John Jay, and others who posted routinely for fear of the government. They posted routinely anonymously. And I think her failure to really understand that or to think that you should register through the government somehow for the internet is something that should disqualify her in the minds of all libertarian, libertarian leaning conservatives. So, um, I mean, that's not very hard for me to get on board with. The, the rationale is, is pretty sound from, from my perspective. But what, what do you think of uh, what Rand Paul is putting out there, Matt? Totally agree with him about uh, in the critique of Nikki Haley for her bonkers idea about everyone registering online. Um, we already have enough of a problem right now with bipartisan censoriousness, especially as it uh, involves technology. And it's just a crazy thing. And she keeps repeating it and it's bad. Um, yeah. Also, Vivek Ramaswamy wants to ban TikTok from existing. Um, and uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has threatened the corporate death penalty over any number of organizations, including the Competitive Enterprise Institute. So I'm not sure how we're exempting, exempting especially RFK Jr., uh, given his track record from uh, you know uh, saying what libertarians uh, should and shouldn't vote for, which again is not my game, but I'm not an elected senator. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting um, uh, what Rand Paul did uh, and has done and what Mike Lee has also done. Mike Lee, before the Iowa caucus, uh, endorsed Donald Trump. And I'm old enough to remember the 2016 convention, which I covered, in which I spent a lot of time in the hip pocket of Mike Lee. Um, and he was the leading voice of opposition to Donald Trump at the 2016 and convention, uh, just screaming and yelling at Donald Trump, this whole uh, Utah delegation situation that went down. And then in October of 2016, after the uh, Hollywood, uh, what's it was called, whatever, the uh, grabbing by the pussy uh, stuff um, came the out. Access Hollywood clip. Access Hollywood. Thank you. Um, uh, Mike Lee was, again, a leading voice of disgust. I could never vote for someone who would ever say anything like that to any woman under any circumstance. Um, and so to watch him uh, in this year, uh, before uh, the primary uh, election, before the Iowa caucus, say, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump because he delivers on his promises. And, you know, that's more important than mean tweets. Um, uh, I don't think that is I think I find that to be a much less serious argument than what Rand just put forth. Um, although on some level, both of them are engaged in the same thing, which is to exist as a senator in 2024, as a Republican senator, um, uh, you need to uh, probably be on board with Donald Trump much more than that was the case in 2016. We forget it right now, but something like 11 uh, sitting U.S. senators in 2016 did not endorse Donald Trump uh, against Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, they uh, sat on their hands or withdrew their endorsements that they'd given before, mostly because the Access Hollywood tape, but some for other reasons as well. Um, you can't, you can no longer basically do that. Mitch McConnell is one of the only people who's been sitting on his hands so far in this uh, election. The Republican Party has come around. If you wish to exist as those people, that's what you have to do. Uh, so if you are a libertarian leaning a politician in power, you are going to find a way to accommodate Donald Trump. And one easiest way to do that is to say that Nikki Haley is bad on war. Um, I think that Nikki Haley is uh, sees, uh, uh, you know, an axis of evil around every corner. Uh, I think many of those people who are in her purported axis of evil are also evil. Um, so uh, but her ideas about what to do about that are going to be different than mine um, uh, for me. And I'm not a libertarian senator, libertarian-ish uh, Republican senator. Uh, for me, how Donald Trump behaved in the run-up to and on January 6th is self-evidently disqualifying. I could never imagine any circumstances which to vote for him. But again, as mentioned before, I presume that I am on a very lonely little island here um, and that uh, Rand Paul has his finger on the pulse of mainstream America more than I do. I am intrigued by the idea of uh, this... Th 
sort of negatively defining like like could we could libertarians settle on someone by process of elimination or like via negativa like uh for haley it's like you know uh online speech check uh war hawk check that's off the list uh trump um you know acting like a maniac on january 6 and many other things check uh and like uh, it's uh, the 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 process of elimination towards a libertarian candidate. I I, I wonder if that's something uh, more politicians could consider. And well, I, it he, also makes yeah. Go ahead. Here's the thing that I was thinking about uh, earlier this morning and last night in long preparation for uh, my grilling by the the two of you, uh, which is what are Donald Trump's libertarian accomplishments? Seriously, what are they? Um, I so, so it, federal regulation cutting right. Uh, so that's that is the one, and it is yeah. a mixed that's record at at best, um, because uh, in addition to cutting regulations, and I wrote a cover story about this in 2017. Um, far he cut regulation far more than than uh, his biggest deregulatory supporters thought possible, but then he I also some... regulated. Um, you know, yeah. uh, like when oh. you when you choke off immigration. Turns out that's actually a regulation. Uh, uh, those trade rules, those are regulatory. I think um, people would also point would to it. appointing Betsy DeVos, though, and some of the Title IX overhaul as yes, well, absolutely. as well as... Um, and also Supreme it? Court appointments. Yeah, um, Supreme Court. But Gorsuch. Gorsuch. Uh, yeah, but Gorsuch. Um, so, I think and, so and that, we've got that's something we've, that, you know, lasts, uh, you know, generations. So. We've got 2.5. We've got yeah. 2.5 libertarian accomplishments, I think. And I, and I agree with the, uh, the Betsy uh, DeVos uh, very much. It didn't, I mean, she was good in that position. It didn't really amount to that much, especially because the, the title, the title was nine was, the, you were right to point to the title nine. That was in, that was in a uh, 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 complete uh, victory, although Biden is. But it was undone, a, right? A, so what does it really matter? There wasn't an enduring impact. It was sort of valuable for four years and then poof, right? I think um, one of the things that you see a lot of elected Republican, libertarian leaning Trump supporters, big mouthful there, point to is Donald Trump on foreign policy. And I think the funny thing about that is that it wasn't Donald Trump who withdrew from Afghanistan. It was Joe Biden. Um, right. And regardless of how you think he did it, and I don't think anyone thinks he did it particularly well. Um, and if you look, I think it was an early suspicion, at least. Mike Lee said um, that, uh, you know, I'll take his uh, fulfilling promises over uh, over mean tweets. I think mean tweets are in many senses people's sense of his accomplishments. Right. Like if people talk about if an anti-war libertarian talks about Donald Trump, uh, chances are they're going to mention his speech in the 2016 primary in South Carolina, where he like absolutely trashed the entire Bush family um, as being like particularly great. And it was particularly great. It was mean. It was wrong and stuff like uh, like on manners level. But as just like calling out an entire wing of foreign policy in the United States and the Republican Party, it was kind of righteous and awesome. It's also basically a mean tweet. It doesn't like how did that change? He didn't start a new big war. That's great. Neither is Biden. Um, uh, but that's also like a, a non negative accomplishment. I think people actually like it. His insult comedy and see that as an accomplishment or at least something that they can affiliate with because it drives his enemies insane. Yeah. Um, and it that is part of the establishment. But yeah, yeah. that's are part of the thrill. Yeah. Chicken. Are you surprised that, um, you know, Ron DeSantis has not uh, attracted more libertarian interest because, yes, he has these, uh, you know, uh, this odd speaking style and these overboard um, social policies in Florida, but also he was the anti-lockdown governor. He, uh, you know, Florida, I can attest, is governed fairly well, uh, at least compared to California where I left. Um, and, you know, we did a whole issue on kind of some of the attributes of Florida in Reason Magazine. Um, wh why do you think, like, are libertarians sleeping on DeSantis? <laughs> I think there was a lot of initial enthusiasm. And let's not forget Thomas Massey endorsed him early. Right. Um, uh, and um, and I'm kind of surprised that more people didn't. But there isn't really a your list of libertarian leading Republicans runs out pretty quickly. Um, and 
uh, yeah. some of the few who existed uh, have long since exited the scene, like Justin Amash, uh, like Jeff Flake from Arizona, um, uh, and uh, and others. Um, so uh, I think that if DeSantis would have run more strenuously on his COVID record, I mean, even in his terrible debate with uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, not saying that he was particularly terrible, although he wasn't great in that debate, but the whole thing was just kind of really dispiriting and awful. That should be such a layup for for uh, for Ron DeSantis. It shouldn't be close. It was and like there's, there's even indicated that it should be a layup because at, at one point, Newsom was almost attempting to hang DeSantis on his own record. It's right. Amazing. Like Newsom was sort of like, you know, saying that he was that DeSantis was insufficiently, you know, letting Florida be insufficiently free from lockdowns. And it's like, well, wait a second. How could you, Gavin Newsom, possibly be saying this? Right. To some degree, it was like Newsom's entire debate strategy was evidence of how Americans broadly now look at lockdowns as a serious mistake. Right. But I think this, what DeSantis did um, when he became a national candidate and being uh, conscious of it, and let's remember, he was within 15 percentage points of Donald Trump one year ago. It was 45 to 30. And he looked like he had the wind at his sails. He went culture war. He went Disney. And that's what he was advertising right. himself to national conservatives. It wasn't necessarily his COVID record and what that would and what his COVID record taught him about stuff like parental rights or the intractability of teachers unions or whatever. Um, it was like, we are going to go after you know, Bud yeah. Light. To uh, so the national conservatives or, who just openly hate libertarians. So it's like, yeah. What, yeah, what do I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't know um, uh, DeSantis' own uh, uh, feeling about uh, the, the libertarian uh, uh, mini quadrant either. But uh, I, I don't think that that was a particularly wise strategy. It's also possible, and you hear this now from DeSantis and sort of the, the pre-postmortems that are coming out, that like there's nothing he could have done um, but I found myself in the uh, the DeSantis Newsom debate um, as someone who absolutely is on DeSantis' corner in uh, the comparative COVID record and think that that's like significant and important. I was wishing uh, that Nikki Haley was the one defending it. Uh, just she's been a better candidate for the most part. She's kind of like uh, not had a great last debate and and she didn't really wasn't very impressive in, in Iowa and uh, in her speech, but like. Uh, she has run a much better public campaign, has been more convincing as someone delivering bon mots uh, and such. Um, he just hasn't been very good at this. So I think it's a combination of of going towards the wrong thing and then just being in the sort of impossible position of, you know, I want to run against Trump and I'm aware that it's Trump's party. So how do I deal with that? Like the 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 cognitive dissonance that that requires uh, seem to wear more heavily on him than it does on Nikki Haley. So I spend a lot of time um, psychoanalyzing both of you, um, you know, whenever I get a minute to myself. And I was thinking, Zach, as you were talking earlier about uh, libertarian beliefs, you know, being pretty marginal, but this enduring hope that you have that they will move, you know, into the mainstream. I was thinking about the degree to which you sort of to some degree, like came of age in Ron Paul revolution times. Is that sort of roughly correct? Broad strokes wise? I, I I don't know about came of age, but I would say that would be you, were, a sort you know of politically activating. One, yeah, yeah, it was a politically activating moment for you. Sure, sure. Um, came into a certain political consciousness then. Um, but Matt, you had a weird origin story to being a libertarian. Um, depending on who you talk to, you kind of en ended up sort of gallivanting around Central slash Eastern Europe for quite a while there, and reporting basically on the fall of communism for uh, many years. How many, how many years were you in Prague? Eight and or like eight in the region, uh, okay. four, in, four in Prague, one in Bratislava and three in Budapest. And it's post-communism. It's the nineties. So, well, yeah. like so give, give us your sort of superhero origin story. That way I can psychoanalyze you even better in the future. How did Those, this sort of make you libertarian ish? And what did that look like? And how does that make you think about things differently than the rest of us weirdos? Mm. Um, could go a long time on that subject. I would say, I mean, I always, I always uh, hated communism. I'm a Cold War baby. Uh, and then when you see the uh, after effects up close of of the absolute like whole of society uh, 
like murderous damage that that does uh, to the environment, uh, you know, which is something that people tend to forget um, to the, the, the educational establishment, to the minds of everybody. Like it just is so destructive. Czechoslovakia was a much more totalitarian place than, than late eighties Hungary where I also lived and that goulash communism, which was softer, but it was just, it is so incredibly distorting and awful. And, um, and then also fell into the, the sway of the writings and activities of Václav Havel, who is uh, behind me on my wall uh, here, on, or at least on that door, um, I, who's writing about uh, politics and philosophy and anti-communism and totalitarianism are just really inspiring. He's sort of like a combination of George Orwell and, and Martin Luther King in some way. There's a lot of similarities and, and cross influences of all of these characters. And he talked a lot about living within the truth or living in truth and like the power of that um uh in a sort of uh, society or system based on lies it's just very inspiring and interesting one way that it affects me to this day or at least informs my uh, understanding of donald trump which might seem a little strange um is that in the post-communist kind of wreckage there arose a series of politicians um some of whom i covered really closely like vladimir mechiar in slovakia and uh, I, who became the sort of like uh, crude, hilarious nationalists railing against elites in foreign capitals, uh, Davos man. Um, oftentimes it would be sort of New York and Jerusalem uh, or New York and Tel Aviv and, uh, and Budapest is where the bad people were coming from and Brussels. Um, but like uh, railing against the far off elites, always railing against George Soros, who had an outside influence on those places and developing the civil society. Um, and it was fascinating to watch them, not just about their own actions, but about the self-defeating reaction to those people by the elites. I, I can't tell you the number. Well, I can't because it's probably just like six because there weren't that many of us covering Slovakia in its first years of independence from Czechoslovakia in 93, 94. But covering Mechiar, once we saw Trump arise, we all just emailed each other like, can you believe it? It happened in our country. Like people, because part of what they do is they go and they are better at democracy than the people who are trying to defend democracy by opposing them, by which I mean they're just better politicians. Donald Trump has an incredible sway. He's incredible on on the on on the stump. If you can't recognize that he's absolutely hilarious, regardless of how much you hate him, then you're missing a big story in American politics. And he's courting that overreaction from people. He wants to say not just like go up to the line. I once interviewed Mechiar and uh, he was about ready to go to America to visit Clinton, although it wasn't a state sp sponsored uh, sanctioned visit. I'm like, what do you hope to accomplish? He's like, I want to uh, show Americans that I don't eat children and uh, that <laughs> and that I could use a fork and knife. And it's like, that's funny. Like it's, he might be an authoritarian leaning kind of guy, but it's kind of funny. Um, and so the I, so many elites back then that I would talk to, including people who had had been partnered up with him and served in his government until the very last minute. And then they said, oh, my God, he's the worst ever. Very similarly to all the Trump people do. They're like, well, you know, he's always going to get the votes out there in the countryside. But what do you expect? Those people are old and stupid. Um, uh, it's this like you have to actually beat Donald Trump and people like that in by doing democracy, not by like finding some extra uh, like uh, uh, democratic means, some shortcuts to dealing with him. And people were always 14th looking for the amendment, shortcuts. perhaps a uh, yeah. 14th amendment. Like, let's let's get him off this ballot. Let's try to disqualify him this way. Mm. Um, uh, it's let's it's, kick him off Twitter and then he'll start his own <laughs> social media company and still get his crazy message out. Like seriously, people were yeah. always like, if we could shut down this newspaper or start that television station or take over this media, then finally we can get through to those stupid people. And, and like, no. And you see the same kind of dumb conversations about journalism in America, which again, I thought I would never see in my lifetime. Journalism, when I was coming up a thousand years ago, was, was understood to be kind of um, sort of anti-authoritarian in its mindset. Uh, at least uh, I deluded myself into believing so. And now it's just like openly censorious and people are policing each other over the adjectives that they use to talk about Trump. Um, just kind of awful. So that shaped my thinking, yes, Liz Wolf, um, uh, in looking at this uh, I had hoped that I wouldn't see it in this country because there's something kind of tawdry about going down the Mechiar slash Victor Orban path. Uh, and it's just amazing to me that Victor Orban, again, someone I've covered since the 90s, has become a lodestar for conservatives in America. Like, 
Wow, congratulations, man. Um, uh, Why but, do they have crushes on Victor Orban? Is there something seductive about him that no. I am perhaps missing? No, or there's, but, misguided. He, no, that, I mean, they, they're seductive about like he rails against Brussels, so centralized authority. He rails against NATO. A lot of people are are uh, are are you know falling out of love with NATO uh, in the Trump. Don't talk right. to me about NATO, Matt Welch. I'm not That's look. Feeling. Don't don't French goodbye me uh, here, uh, Liz Wolf. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, he, and he, and he railed against immigration. He said, I, I don't want immigration policy to be set by Angela Merkel. And he's kind of right about that. Um, regardless of what you think about what they, their immigration policy should be, um, one, it makes sense to have a country be in charge of its own immigration policy. And it's kind of weird that you would, you would outsource that. He's also super corrupt. Hungary also has gone from being the leader of the pack on, uh, post-communist economic growth and GDP per capita to being one of the worst, just a, an abysmal uh, record of uh, uh, in the economy. He's taken over and, and like uh, strong armed various churches. Um, he's really consolidated power. He written the constitution, cracked down on media, done a bunch of stuff uh, that objectively sucks. And I have pointed this out several times to conservatives and they honestly don't care. And part of them just wants to do that. And you look at Trump, there's a, a lot of will to power too. And I presume if he wins election, you will see him follow through on some of, for example, his threats to sick the Department of Justice or the uh, or the uh, FTC against media companies in direct retaliation for their uh, behavior. He said something like that just yesterday. Um, but I think that he has much more chance of pulling things like that off. The conservatives, um, especially the ones who are uh, populist, anti-elite conservatives like Chris Rufo and like uh, Ron DeSantis in a way, they want to, they have a desire to wield government power um, against those institutions. There's a thirst out there for that. Victor Orban does that. So that's what they like about Victor Orban. They see him as successful for that. And then some of the more deluded ones like Rod Dreher believe that he's like the last voice protecting the West as if Hungary is like the bastion of Christianity, which is an absolutely insane and self-deluded. What's the thing that will disabuse some of these conservatives of the notion that Victor Orban uh, is creating the promised land? Uh, visiting any uh, place in Hungary that's not called Budapest, probably. <laughs> Budapest is super delightful, cosmopolitan, Jewish, uh, increasingly, thankfully, um, city. I say that just because their uh, community have been so decimated uh, in World War II and, uh, and elsewhere. And it's nice to see, even though um, uh, Orban and people like him have flirted with uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, rehabilitation of explicitly anti-Semitic characters from Hungarian history, um, that there's been a flourishing of the Jewish community in, in Budapest. Uh, it's also the best part of town, the uh, uh, that district. But um, uh, it's great. It's super cosmopolitan. And you go there like, my God, why can't everything be like this? Well, it's because you actually hate cities like this in America. <laughs> you know, like Tucker Carlson giving architecture lessons about, about Budapest <laughs> is just, uh, it's objectively hilarious. Your insight about uh, Budapest and then the countryside reminds me a little bit of something that I was paying attention to last year when I was in Bucharest, which is different than Budapest. You dumb people, uh, if you in fact confuse them, no, not actually. Um, and I was thinking in Romania, about Bucharest and how, you know, Matt, you wrote about this, I think in the mid aughts, like flourishing movie scene, movie production uh, industry there. Really interesting. I was noticing this past time, um, you know, a flourishing of the restaurant scene, a lot of immigrants from other parts of Europe coming in and opening up really, really interesting foods. Obviously, Romanian food has sort of you know, is is not really something to write home about and has under Ceausescu is sort of, you know, took on less prominence and there were some issues with food shortages and such. So the Romanian food scene never really developed, but now immigrants are coming in and really restoring a lot of that. So you look at actual Bucharest and it's thriving and it's cosmopolitan. And yeah, there's some ugly, brutalist communist architecture still, but it's lovely. And then you go 30 minutes outside into the countryside and it's just full on rust belt people with decaying teeth kind of everywhere right like I mean, awful, literal, I was... literal covered wagons and yeah uh, and uh and commie uh, housing factories and blocks that are totally in rubble like exactly the... and it's sort of a little bit of this like well wait a second i could understand how you could emerge from in your telling budapest and in my telling bucharest if you'd only been in those places with a certain sense of oh this must be how this country is run this must be you know these countries have just recovered wonderfully and leadership is currently absolutely excellent and it's like well surely if you see anything outside of that little tiny sample size 
your view begins to get pretty complicated. So I'm sort of curious about like, will the Rod Dreyers of the world, like, is, is that sort of part of the problem? Like, did we diagnose it or are we missing something? Yes. Um, I, I would also, um, uh, and, and like Budapest has a bigger, every country has a, you know, country mouse, city mouse situation, yeah, but, course. but like, I think the next uh, largest, uh, Budapest has 2 million people and the next largest city has like 300,000, I think. Um, and uh, that's similar to, uh, Cuba, uh, and not many other countries. Usually there's like, there isn't such a huge split. So that's going to create all kinds of weirdnesses that are pretty significant. Romania, it's a little bit more spread out. I would just add, um, for those, there might be some people who are sort of anti-interventionists, anti-U.S. interventionists who think that Viktor Orban is a hero. Um, uh, you need to think that one through, uh, because, um, one of the things that he did, it's one of the single most destabilizing, uh, acts to peace in the world by a democratically elected leader over the last 20 years is that he gave voting rights to ethnic Hungarians who live to 5 million ethnic Hungarians who live outside the borders. I don't know if it affects 5 million, but there's 5 million in the immediate surroundings. Um, and you don't have to have been born in Hungary. So ethnic Hungarians, and, and like, if you look at the history of, of Europe uh, over the last uh, 100 years, it's not real great for what happens when a country uh, decides to uh, give special rights to its uh, erstwhile uh, citizens who aren't even their citizens in neighboring countries. That is a recipe for unrest. And you're seeing it um, with the Hungarian minority in Ukraine um, and uh, also in uh, Serbia and in Slovakia. It's, it's super not great. Um, so if you like him for anti-war reasons, um, you should think that one through too. Well, with that, I want to thank you for talking to us, Matt Welch. We so appreciate having you on. Where can people find you? Uh, at reason.com. Uh, check out the Reason Roundtable podcast. That's the correct you answer. All Good well, no, on Twitter at uh, Matt Welch as well. Wonderful. Not Matt Welch. <laughs> God. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and Facebook page every Thursday and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Friday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and please rate and review the show. Whose voice is that?